Hello again, everyone, and thank you so much for coming to another Manchester Memories. Our next meeting will be on Tuesday, May 15th, and we have a gentleman who's sitting right here, Dave Cannell, who will be our speaker that Tuesday. So I hope you can join us. And today I am honored to introduce Jim Comar, who I'm sure all of you know. He is with the Bank of Bennington and has been in Manchester since you were just about Forever. Old. Forever, yep. yeah. So he will be a great spokesman for the subject. <laughs> um, he's vice president at the Bank of Bennington, and he and his family uh, live in East Dorset. Right. Yeah. Right. So, oh, and the best part, the family owned the quality restaurant, where, as I understand it, a lot of interesting things went on during the years. <laughs> right? <Yep. laughs> anyway, please welcome Jim. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Let me know if you can't hear me. Sometimes I don't project my voice well, but uh, fun to be here. Uh, I feel honored to be a part of this program. Um, you finally do get to that age where you're uh, somebody that knows some history of the community you live in, and I guess I'm getting older, but that's okay because it's been fun along the way, and I'm happy to talk about Manchester and family and businesses and that kind of thing. So first of all, you may or may not know that I'm the third child of seven for Pete and Bev Comar, um, and I have two brothers older than me and four sisters younger. Just lost one of my sisters in September, but we're still all a family. Um, and we lived on Cottage Street. My folks bought a house there in 1950, and they stayed there until my dad died in 1997. So it was the homestead. It's the only place we ever lived as a family. And it was the best neighborhood in Manchester. A lot of people probably don't know that, but hello, dear. Have a seat. And um, a lot of people probably don't know that, but you kind of have to name names to kind of set the pace for how wonderful some place was. And we grew up with Doug and Joan Shaw's kids. Uh, you all probably know Andy and his sister Cindy particularly because they're still active in the community. Joe and Fran Markey's kids and Dana's the guy that runs Mistral's. He's the chef at Mistral's restaurant and he's, he's the owner of that business. Mike and Mike Norath and his family were there and he was an attorney here for a long time. His sister Kelly is still living at Equinox Terrace. Um, Howard and Kay Ambrose were active in, at Burn Burton. She was a coach there. They had two daughters that were, they were kind of the old kids on Cottage Street, but they were part of our group. Um, well, it's always dangerous to forget people when you're moving along with these names and, and such, but I'll probably, oh, Carl and Eva Lou Kilburn li live next door to us, and they had four kids, and uh, my brother Greg and I used to babysit for them. We were the neighborhood babysitters at one point, but... They, but it was a really wonderful place to live. You know who else lived uh, near us was Orrin and Phyllis Beatty's family. They lived out at the end of Mountain View Terrace, but their horse barn was at the end of Cottage Street. So they were part of our group. You know, we would do, when we were kids, we would have like the neighborhood carnival or something like that, and they'd bring their horses, and we'd have horse shows and craziness, acting like clowns and stuff, but we're all a group together. We all grew up together, and it, it, I, I love the fact that we're all, a lot of us are still here, and we're the, we're the people of Manchester and having fun doing that. So um, I wasn't one of those Comar kids that was athletic, and you know I was kind of a late bloomer, and I didn't play sports, but I did always like music. So. When I was in the third grade, I think, I started to learn how to play the saxophone and was part of the Manchester School Band. And the director of Manchester School Band back then was Mr. Yanni. Do you remember him, Bill? Yeah, you do too. Yep. So he was our teacher and he was the director of the band and the band was a pretty big deal. So I learned how to play the sax and I stayed with the band until it ended when I was in high school. Uh, I think Mr. Yanni retired, and they had a hard time finding somebody to replace him, right? So, but we did everything. We, played, we put on concerts on the stage at, we call it the elementary school back then. Uh, you know, we had a, at least an annual concert there. Do you still we, play the sax? 
No, my father gave it away when I wasn't looking. <clears throat> um, yeah. We played on the stage. We always played in the Loyalty Day Parade. We played marching music then. We had uniforms and everything. We wore, the, uh, the guys wore white pants, white shirts, white bucks. Do you remember white bucks, the shoes? We, we had to wear white bucks. And we had these awesome capes that were blue and white and a hat. I have a picture of myself in that. It's really kind of cool. But. So we marched in the parade every year. And also back then, Manchester would have a Memorial Day parade too. And we, it was short, but we would march into the cemeteries. We would go to Factory Point Cemetery, and then they would bus us up to the village, and we would march in the, into the Delwood Cemetery to employ some of the memorial music there. And it was really kind of cool. And the other thing that we did that people have probably forgotten about is that there was a bandstand on the front playground over at the elementary school. Does anybody remember that? Yeah. And in the summertime, I think it was, on, for some reason I remember that it was Tuesday night, we would put on concerts there, you know, every, like for, I don't know, I'll say six or eight weeks during the summer. So we would set up at that little bandstand, which was over by Alberta Harrington's house, up in that corner. And the, the patrons would come and drive on to the playground and sit in their cars and listen to us play. So we're up there in the corner, and there's all these cars out there. And we would play we, you know, we, a lot of the stuff that we had really practiced a lot. And every time we finished a song, all the patrons would blow their horns and, and acknowledge how good or how maybe not so good the band was. But, but it was a really fun local thing that we did. And I loved it. I thought it was like the best thing going. But, um, and, I, and my sister Carol thought she might want to play the saxophone at some point too, but she never really got into it. And I took it over from my brother Mike, who played it for about a year and decided he didn't like it. And my brother Greg tried to play the trombone because my grandfather Komar played the trombone in the Manchester band when they first moved here from Bennington. And I think some time ago now, I gave his band hat to the Historical Society. We still had that, but, but his, he had a beautiful sax, or trombone and Greg did try to play that, and he didn't get into it either, but he, he figured it out just long enough to make some noise with it. But, <laughs> but um, the Loyalty Day Parade was, you know, everybody participated in the Loyalty Day Parade back then. It seemed like it was huge. And, you know, I started my life as a little kid riding on top of the fire trucks and stuff. You know, they let the kids get up there, and, and you know, the trucks were always part of the parade, so we're always up there. And then um, I have a picture at home of Grubb, who did one of the presentations here recently. He had what we called the little car, and it, it, was, a, it was a little car that his dad built for him. It was a, had a Briggs & Stratton engine on it. It was kind of an open air thing made out of, well, there, there was a frame under it, but it was plywood seats and a front and a big <laughs> steering wheel and stuff, and it was the neighborhood fun thing to do. But when it came time for a Loyalty Day parade, they would paint it up so it looked like a fire truck. So, um, so we, when I was 10, we rode in the parade, and there was five of us on there, Grubbs driving. It was Alan Wilcox and Alan Hosley and Andy Shaw and me on, on, the, on the thing. So it's really kind of fun to see it. I was standing up in the back behind Grubb, hanging on to him because he was kind of a crazy man behind the wheel. But... but <laughs> But it was, yeah, he's still a crazy man. But, but history of doing some of that stuff. And, and in that picture is a crowd of people on the sidewalk. We're on Main Street. And the women were dressed up in hats. And the men had jackets and ties on and stuff. You know, that was in 1962. So it was, but it was really, it was cool. It was wonderful to uh, be a part of all that history. And about that, you know, I'm, I'm a Comar. My grandparents came here from Bennington in 1920, and my grandmother started the Quality Restaurant. It was sort of like a little pie plate, you know, going there for pie and ice cream or something to start with, but it quickly, quickly evolved into, you know, a more of a, of a regular restaurant menu. And when they came here, my grandfather had been working for the A&P supermarket or A&P stores back then, and he was 
working in, uh, he worked in Bennington and I forget where all else, but there was an opportunity for him to come here and work in the A&P store across the street where Fortuna is now, or you know, where yeah. Wilson's, the, well the liquor store was there that when was I was a kid. A it was an A&P store, yeah. yep, yep. And it was the liquor store for a long time. And anybody remember Clay Bartlett? Yeah. We all know Landy Bartlett, his dad, Clay Bartlett. Um, he was an artist, and he painted a picture of that building from inside the quality restaurant. And it was, wow. it was the, it's really cool. We have it. One, I, think, I think my brother Mike has it now, but it's like in the, uh, in the front window, painting a picture across the street, and it's the liquor bottles lined up in the window and all that kind of <laughs> stuff. But because but, uh, it, it's kind of cool to have because it was a liquor store for quite yeah. a long time. So, um, so we have that there. But Grandpa pretty quickly left the A&P store because the restaurant was, you know, it got successful pretty quick because there weren't, weren't many restaurants in Manchester at the time. So they... Um, he went over there and started cooking with my grandmother and got things going. And she started it by herself. She started. She started it. Yeah. Wow. Yep. She was. I always said that my grandmother was really kind of a woman before her time. <laughs> she was a. She was a person who only went to the fourth grade, and she was the oldest of thirteen kids. Wow. So she did what families did back then. She stayed home and helped raise the rest of them. You know, as more kids came along, and her youngest brother was born at the same time that my father was born. They were, they were, they were, you know, my father was his nephew, but they were the same age. So see, that's, that's what happened back then was that kind of large family thing. But they, yeah, they, when they first moved in there, they lived in the basement of that building. There was, there was some, it became the big, the big prep kitchen along the way, but but there was some living quarters down there, which I, it was hard to imagine. But they did do that, and then um, when the they took over the building, they moved to the upstairs, and that apartment on the second floor was their home for like 50 years. Really, it was beautiful up there. It was a really cool place. And sometime in the 1940s, I guess, they added the triangle room, the dining room that we called the triangle room. Um, they added that on. They needed more space and. Um, actually, the restaurant, the, the beginning space of it was divided down the middle, and there was a barber shop on one side and the restaurant was on the other, but they took that over pretty quickly, too, because it just really was successful right from the start. They did well there. So um, my brothers and I worked there through high school, and my sister Carol worked there after us, but n nobody else did, but when we worked there, you got to know that Manchester was the hub of the ski industry at that point. So we worked every weekend year round and we were allowed to take one Saturday night, Saturday night off a year to go to a school dance or something. But, but in the winter time, when the ski season kicked into gear, there was a standing line every Friday and Saturday night. They were out the door, out the door and down the street. And, and it went on, I'm telling you, it was like an endurance test sometimes. It was so busy there. But, and the same people, you'd see a lot of the same faces every week. Um, but, it, it, but it was fun. It was a, it was a lot of work. But um, my grandmother was a taskmaster, and she was, a, she was a wonderful person to work for because she had incredible work ethic. So if you learned anything from anybody, it was going to be her. But it was very, uh, uh, it was good. It was great. We all worked really hard there. Yeah. And, and when the restaurant was closed, we were in there waxing floors and cleaning the fry later and doing all that kind of stuff that you can't do when the place is open. So we were, we were Pete's best uh, hardworking crew there for sure. And you know, the, you know, the claim to fame there has always been the Norman Rockwell painting that was called War News. And it hung, you know, when you walked in the door, it was straight into the back of the restaurant, hung down over the family table there, yeah. what we call the family table. And that painting was done by Norman Rockwell during World War II. And it was, it's my grandfather behind the counter there. It's a restaurant setting, you all may remember it. And there were three guys sitting at the counter and they're talking, listening to a radio about war news. So Norman painted that picture with the intent that it become one of the Saturday evening post covers and it it never. It wasn't. It didn't. That didn't happen. So he gave the painting to my grandparents. Where is it then? It's. It's now in the 
permanent Rockwell collection down in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. Wow. And my fa it was belonged to my family. So when they sold the restaurant in 1975, they sold the painting to the Corner House Museum. And so here's the numbers. I can tell this now because Dad's not around to give me hell about it. But <laughs> they sold the restaurant, fully viable. Uh, you know, so the next person could just unlock the door the next day. The building, the business, the goodwill, and everything for $95,000. That was 19, 1975. Now, of course, who, the, who knows? And they sold the painting for $45,000. And you know now, we all know the Tracty story about finding the painting in the wall and how much that painting brought. It was a Rockwell painting. It was like 15 million bucks. So it's OK. We enjoyed it. It was part of our family. And we all have Rockwell things that used to hang in the restaurant. Uh, I, Kathy and I have in our family room a display of the Four Freedoms. It was the first issue of reproductions of the originals. It was prints, and my grandparents had it framed in this nice display, and they had Norman autograph it for them. So we, ha so we have that. It's really cool to have. Yeah? Wasn't the painting of the war news behind the counter? Like nope. It, no? it wasn't. Nope. It was always in that same spot. You know, you yep. think of it, though, because that's where it was painted. It shows well, Clarence behind the counter, and yeah. so you visualize it being there, but it wasn't. It wasn't. Know. Nope, it wasn't. There was another big painting behind the counter, big long one that was that um, some local artist painted for them. That, that had him in the white. Yep, nope, that was the War News one, that, and that was always in the, on that wall. That was the only position it was ever in, was back I there. Know, I could swear I saw it yeah. when I first came to Vermont in 59. Yeah, no, it's the... Because that was always like a bar in the work counter back there, yeah. Um, what hung there, uh, too, was above that counter where you're, you're alluding to, there was like a soffit up there. And there was always paintings on display up there for sale. And the, it, they were all uh, Hazel Kitts wires. Do you remember Hazel wires from over the mountain? She was a local artist, and she used to sell the paintings in the quality. And we have one of those, too. Kathy and I have one of those at our house. but. But yeah, the, there was a lot of fun stuff that went on there. I feel like there's times during this presentation that I have to say some names because people, people in Manchester were part and parcel of everything that we did. You know, we provided a place for people to gather. But there, uh, and doing this is dangerous because I'm, I'm only going to mention a few, and I could go on and on mentioning names. But here's a few people that, that I can link up to the restaurant. Um, the Zulo family. Uh, Teresa Zulo, who a lot of us knew and loved and had her as a teacher in elementary school. Her sisters, Philomena, we called her Phil, and Louise, who was Louise Coburn, and she had a brother, Tony. Those were the ones that we knew the most, and they were friends of my grandparents. It was that young social group of people, so we have pictures great pictures of parties that they had and that kind of stuff. And Teresa's there with the big fur collar on her coat. You know, she, she, she uh, really, she dressed to the nines all the time. And uh, so there's some great, great things like that. But the, but the Zulos were always there. Who, who, uh, somebody must remember George Roberts. He was the guy that owned the brick building that's next door to uh, the... It's next door to uh, the Mexican restaurant there. What the hell is it? Gringo Jacks. Gringo Jacks. And it was the guide office. That's right. There you go. That's right. Yep. But when, yep, absolutely. But I remember him living in there. And the play, if you looked in the front window, it was just all piled up with stuff. But, but he would come in the restaurant. And, you know, he was always part of Manchester people. Um, and, of course, Chris Sweezy and... And Maud Valley, Maud's in that Gossips oh, painting wow. with, my grandmother is in the Rockwell painting that's the Gossips with all the people who are there twice. They're talking to somebody this way and then they turn around and talk to somebody that way. And my grandmother and Maud Valley are side by side in there. And she lived upstairs over what was the Briggs Insurance Agency over by the, on the corner there across from the Baptist Church. But she was always in and out of the restaurant. Um, uh, Marion Healy, my God, she was my grandmother's favorite friend. They'd talk every night, at, uh, you know, when we worked there. 
on weekends, they'd call each other about midnight just to say good night. And Mary liked her cocktails, and she was a lot of fun, and she partied with my grandmother, and her family owned Healy's store down in the what we call the depot, where Al Ducci's is now. That was like a that was like a little uh, neighborhood grocery kind of a thing, and her family ran that. So, she, and Marion lived in the homestead, which is right on Center Hill, the, where past and present has been. Jeff and Kathy Metzger's house there was the Healy homestead, right, Bill? Yeah, yeah, I didn't know that. yeah, yeah, it was. That's Marion lived there, right there to the end. Yeah, yep, yep. Um, George and Mary Heaslip, you know, they, Mary. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Mary Heaslip was a Lombardi or part of that Lombardi family, Grasso's Lombardi's, and George had Heaslip's fuel, and you know he, they were, he, yep. And Henry and Irene Sherbino were folks that were in there a lot, and Henry owned the, uh, he owned a car dealership and a you know repair place, and Irene was about this tall, and, uh, and he was a big man like this. But Lynn Walker, Lynn and Jane Walker. Um, Lester Gallner, he was dad's accountant. He had a, an accounting business here in town. Um, Doc, who remembers Doc Mullins? Doc, he was an older gentleman that would come here in the summertime and he'd stay at the Coburn house. And he, uh, he had been a pharmacist in New York City, I believe, and he would hang out over at Whipple's. And he'd come in the restaurant every day for, for lunch or dinner or whatever and he smoked a big fat cigar and and you know he'd, he'd he'd stop and talk to my grandmother every day but he was here just in the summertime but we always looked forward to him being here he was old when I first knew who he was but and of course Fred Nicklewhite was around you know yeah he was uh, here for a long time and the only other ones I'll mention are Reed and Sis LeFay remember Reed LeFay was the guy that had the rides that we used to have at the Rotary Carnival, which I'll talk about in a minute. And um, he, he, and Sis, and after Reed died, Sis married Chris Sweezy. So they, they all kept in the family. And there's help there. You know, we all remember some of the waitresses and the, I could go on and on. So maybe I better keep moving. Um, sure, yeah. The other thing that I make claim to, of course, is Factory Point Bank. Uh, because I, I worked there for 30 years, and when I was a kid, Factory Point Bank building, what I remember there was uh, Heinel's Clothing Store, Purdy's Shoe Store, Factory Point Bank on the street level, and upstairs was the Opera House and the Masonic Temple. And the... Uh, when I went to work at the bank in 1971, Purdy's had moved across the street to the building where Rite Aid is. They occupied one little end of it. And Heinel's had taken over a little bit of the space that Purdy's had. In fact, the bank had taken over the remainder of it. They had expanded a little, so they kicked Purdy's out and, and gave Heinel's the rest of the space. So that's what was going on there when I went there in 1971, and in 1973, I think it was, the bank again did a major renovation there and took over the whole building. So everybody moved. Heinels went up the street, the Masonic Temple didn't, uh, they moved, and the Opera House, which is, we all had history in the Opera House. I went there for Cub Scout banquets and we sang on the stage here and there, that kind of thing. It was, the bi it was a big space as you faced the building on the right hand side upstairs. It was just a big room with a stage and a couple of bathrooms, if I remember right. Does that sound right? I went just once to one of those. Yep, yep. And the stairs you had to climb up. Yep, that's right. And there's a kitchen at the top of the stairs. But the bank took over the whole space. Everybody else left. And I was working there when that happened. So um, it was uh, it was really beautiful space. And what I've, I found in a... My gr I, I meant to tell you this, that my grandmother created a scrapbook in her life at the restaurant. Every time something came up, she would cut out newspaper articles or she'd have a picture of something or some letter from somebody or something, and she, she made a scrapbook out of it. There wasn't a whole lot of rhyme or reason to it, but it, there's a lot of stuff in it, and I have it now. I feel like it's a, it's a real privilege to have that because it's an incredible resource. And I've kind of memorized it at this point. I open it up, look at things, and I've, it's all pretty familiar. But um, 
in that scrapbook is a, I love this, it's a newspaper clipping of the grand opening of the new Factory Point building after they did the renovations. And there's Homer Ellis on a stepladder out at the front entrance hanging the new Factory Point sign that was over the door, which was, you know, was so cool. And, and I was there when that was going on, of course. So then, 2007, Berkshire Bank comes along and takes the place over. And I was driving up Main Street one day when, son of a gun, if there wasn't somebody climbing up a ladder taking that sign down. Oh, oh my God. Yeah. So I saw it go up and I saw it go down. I had a lump in my throat. Yeah. You know, but but isn't, that, isn't that kind of cool? Yeah. yeah. Pardon? I didn't, no, I didn't take that one, but I got another one. Uh, there, was, there was a sign at the, the branch office that's now Starbucks. That, I worked in that space for quite a long time, and there was a, that canopy out in the back where the drive up was. There was a factory point sign that hung on the soffit there. And uh, Maurice and, and uh, Maurice Johnson and those guys were the caretakers there. And one day I saw him and said, hey, are you, are you, is that sign ever coming down from there? And he said, yeah, we're supposed to be taking it down. We keep forgetting to do it. So I said, well, if you ever take it down, can I have it? So a couple of days later, I found it by my car over at the Bank of Bennington. So, <laughs> so I have my, my little memorial to Factory Point inside my garage at home, which was really kind of cool. Um, I'll tell you some names there, too, just quickly. When I started there in 1971, these are the people that probably were seriously instrumental in my uh, formulating my career in banking, because they were there. It was small business. We all worked hard and worked together. And when I first went there, there were still two past presidents there. Earl Storrs was there. He worked part time. And Chris Schaefer, who had been the most recent past president, was still chairman of the board. So he had, a pres he had an office there, and he was there pretty regularly. Boy, staunch, old, traditional bankers. What a privilege to be cross paths with them. And of course, Homer Ellis was the president, and he hired me, guess where? At the family table at the Quality Restaurant. <laughs> I, 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 I went in there for lunch one day, and he's sitting at the family table, and I sat down there, and he said, so, Jim, what are you doing this summer? And I said, well, I guess, I guess I'm going to work here. That's what I've been doing. And he goes, well, how would you like to come to work at the bank? And I said, well, okay, what doing? And he said, well, we need an errand boy. You can roll a coin. You can, you know, you can do whatever we... And I said, uh, why not? So I never left. Well, I kind of never left I, until I'd been there for about 30 years. But... Uh, that was Homer that got me there, and Chet Andrews had just come on board at that point as a vice president, and um, he worked there until he retired. Don Johnson um, was the cashier there, and I worked really closely with him and learned a lot of the operational side of banking. He was great. Um, and how about Marion Batchelor? She was there like 40 years probably. Yep. And Peggy Bryant, loved Peggy Bryant to death. Susan smiling because she worked there with me at some point. And we, we worked with all these people. Peggy was awesome. And my, my second or third grandmother was Louise Hartwell. Um, she was there when I got there. And she, she was the first person to start showing me how to do banker stuff. And um, she was approaching retirement age. But she really did kind of become like a grandmother to me. I actually did her eulogy at her funeral. Um, loved, loved her like a grandmother. Phyllis Binkley, who just passed away recently, was there when I went there. Um, she was a lender as much as anything and did a great job of that. And the only other one I'll remember uh, mentioned present this time is Thelma Goodell, who's still living. I, I just had lunch with her for her birthday. She was turned 94. And she's out and around doing her thing. Yeah, well, he, was, he came and went. <laughs> yeah. John Johnson, I mentioned, mentioned Don. Yep, he was great, too. Um, yep, that, uh, he, I don't know that Don ever really retired. He, he became sick with cancer and passed away, but um, he, was, he, was, he was a great guy. I, I really learned a lot from him. So maybe you should move on, because here I am. It's already 1.30. Here's something else for me to ask you. Who remembers the Manchester Bicentennial back in 1961? Oh, yeah. Yep. I was... Yep, 
Yep. I was nine, I think, when, when it happened. But for some reason, I always remembered that event. It was very local. The, they set up this temporary sort of a log cabin thing over on the somewhere in the vicinity of Rite Aid in that neck of the woods. It was like the base of operation. Do you remember that? My brother Mike talked to me about that. And it was a, it was a period sort of a thing. The men in town, this was the funniest thing, because the men in town all tried to grow beards, because they all wanted to look like everybody did 200 years before. And my father had the most <coughs> pathetic beard of anybody in the crowd. But he did try to, he did try to do it. Um, and they all were, you know, the women dressed in some of the 200-year-old clothes and that kind of stuff. And um, we have this really nice picture of Ted and Sylvia Hopkins standing outside the quality in, in their garb. They were a wow. handsome, handsome couple. And they just played that part so well. It was, pretty, it was really fun to see them there. You know, it was great. And um, I believe that what, this is what I remember about that event. It was seriously patriotic, wasn't it? Uh, you know, uh, that we were singing patriotic music. It went on for four or five days, um, from, what I re from what I remember. And there was music, and there was a street dance, and, but, but red, white, and blue everywhere. Uh, you know, there was Uncle Sam, and, you know, there was all that kind of... It was so great. I, I feel like we're missing that a little bit these days, the patriotic piece of things. But that's what I've remembered forever. Jesse. There you go. Yes. Brothers of the Brush and sisters of the Swiss. Yep, see? We had the veterans in the... Yes. Yeah, we had a little parade and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, uh, Ed Bigelow and Nancy Otis wrote a book about that. So, uh, you know, it's, it's available if you ever want to see that. I can't, I'm sorry, I can't tell you what the name of it is now, but it was about that first 200 years. I want to tell you... Uh, it's, it's in the library? Great, there you have it. See Cindy, she'll show you. Here's a fun thing to talk about. Um, I like to say that we were the Rotary kids because everybody, my dad was a, in the Rotary and he was the president a couple of times and the Rotary was very active in Manchester and they did, they had a, they owned the Rotary pool. It was the, it was the summer place for all of us kids to go swimming and it was over by the elementary school on the other side of the parking lot from the gym. It was out in that space where I think there's some playing fields there now. And it was, I don't know if it was Olympic size, but it was a pretty big pool. But get a load of this. It was, there was no filtration system. They pumped the water out of the river behind the pool. And every, uh, once a week, they pulled the plug and drained the pool. And us rotary kids would go there and scrub the pool. They'd turn the pump back on and fill it back up. So the first Wednesday or whatever it was, the water was clean. And as the week went on, no exaggeration, as the week went on, it, the water got whiter and whiter and whiter from a heavy dose of chlorine every day. And it was probably, uh, according to today's standards, it'd be against the law. But we had a hell of a, we had a, hell of a good time there. And we, all and we did. And, and it, the, the good thing is you got a second bathing suit every summer because the chlorine <laughs> rotted the other one off from me. About <laughs> But really, no lie. I can remember my bathing suit was blue and it turned to white. I bet it did, Georgia. I can remember mine getting holes in it. So, yeah. Uh, but the, they, they did other things there, too. There was a carnival every summer, the Rotary Carnival. And it was there at the pool area. There was, that, uh, there was a big green space there. And Reed LeFay would bring his rides. And there would be all kinds of booths and fun stuff. And we would also have a water show in the pool. All of us kids uh, who could swim would do synchronized swimming and diving contests and stuff. And um, it, we did that every year. It was, it was lots of fun. And another, another thing that they did um, in anticipation of the carnival was uh, to auction off a car. The guy that owned the Ford garage would somehow give him a deal on, on a car, brand new car. And the Rotary kids would, every, every week, we'd have to take our turn uh, sitting at a card table out inside the quality restaurant or factory point bank or whatever, selling tickets to the car. And at the, at, they would pull the ticket at the carnival, and somebody would always win the car. And that went on for a long time. And my grandmother, Komar, ended up with one of them, but she didn't win it. Whoever 
whoever won it didn't want it, so she bought it from them. And it was a 1961 or 62 Mercury Comet. And she had it forever. And she was the world's worst driver, so it, it, every once in a while she'd bend a fender or something and have to have it fixed. But Well, not very well. I can't believe it. But she had one of the, we all said she had one of the rotary cars because she really did. So that was, uh, um, and the lifeguards there at the time were Betty Treat, who is Betty Goff these days, if you probably know her, Barney Duke, um, Charlene Knapp, and we called her Nugget. Yep, Sally DeLong and others, but these were the, the old standbys when I was there. Barbara Barden was one of them, too. Yep. I can't uh, talk about the Rotary Club without talking about the Lions Club for a minute, too, because they were equally as active in Manchester and did wonderful things here um, and helped the community in a lot of ways. They did fundraisers and supported scholarships and uh, maybe still do to some extent, but back then they were equally as active as the Rotary Club. And they would do things like they owned a, one, or they occupied one of those big buildings over at what's now the Rec Park. And every summer they would collect stuff, and they'd have a big auction there. And also, uh, that was a great that was a great fundraiser. And another notable thing that they did historically was that they would uh, have a variety show every year here at the on the stage at Mems. And it was all local talent, and it, sometimes it was great, and sometimes it was not so great. Yeah. But there were, but there, we had some really quite interesting local talents. Yeah. Mo Thompson was out there dressed like a woman, or whatever they would do. Uh, you know, there were and some wonderful voices singing. And um, Dan Noble uh, had a right. band, and he would be the background music, or not, or they would just be playing other stuff. Yep, yeah. yep, yep. And um, uh, when Kathy, and, uh, I should tell, I'll tell you this really quick. When Kathy and I were get, going to get married, we were engaged, and we, we went to the Lions variety show, and we're sitting out there in the audience, and the, it was one of the years where it wasn't so good, and they were, do, they were doing some things to just try to fill up the, the thing, and they started playing this game up on the stage where they were calling people out of the audience to come up there take your shoes off and throw them in a pile, and then you'd have to go find your, your partner's shoes. And the one that did it first or something won. I don't know what the deal was. So I'm sitting there like this going, oh, God, I know they're going to call us up there. And she's going, no, they won't. No, they won't. <laughs> sure enough, Jim Comar and Kathy Pierce. So we go up there onto the stage, and we didn't win we, because it was, everybody was sort of flustered, and it was really very pathetic. But there we were among the crowd. <laughs> And, and then um, we got married at the Baptist Church, and I was friends with Dick Olmsted, and we got, became very active there, and I started singing in the choir, and then um, Dick thought it would be a good idea if the choir performed at the variety show, and it, it was, you know, it was good, you know, sometimes it was good, sometimes it wasn't, but we were there. And it was, so we got to sing it in the variety show every year as a church choir. We would oh, do our, years? yeah, we did it for quite a long time, yeah, didn't we, Martha? For seven years. Yeah, yeah. Barry Madison did his Victor Borka thing two years. Yes, that's right. And that was hysterical. Yep, but it was we became part of that at that point. It was really kind of fun. Yeah, um, I'm running out of time, really. But does anybody remember? moving the landmark building from where Rite Aid is right now. Yeah. There, it was a beautiful house. It was an, yep, it was a really beautiful old colonial house with kind of a little addition on it that had a little gift shop in it. And it belonged to, at the time, Phyllis Binkley and Jean V. Brock. And yep, and they were approached apparently to vacate that space so that Grand Union could build their new store there. So they offered that they would move the building for them, and they, they secured a piece of land up on Barnumville Road, and they moved the house up there in two pieces. Yeah, and it now belongs to Abe and Brenda Madcor. Yeah, they've lived there for, that's their home. It's been there for a long time, but we have a, in my parents' stuff, we have a movie of that house being moved. I love that Yep, yep, and it, yep. 
Yeah, it's a, it was, it's a beaut and now it's beautiful too. It looks nice. It's all up in, kind of up high in a meadow up there on Barnabas Road. It's a perfect spot for it, but it was a big deal moving a big house yeah. like that, you know, but um, the town all got involved in it. You know. What? Did I write that down? I would, I don't know, I'm going to say it was probably the early 60s. Early? No, no, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. No. Nope, it wasn't. Sorry. <laughs> it wasn't. No, it, no total. It wasn't. No, it wasn't afterward. No, it wasn't. No. It was, no, it wasn't. Sorry. Sorry. Um, and um, one other, another thing. The St. Paul's Church built a new church in 1966. We all went to the old one up in. We're, oh, really? Up in the one in the. Yep. Yeah. What's now the. Well, we call it the Industrial Arts Building, but. Yeah, that's. That was the Catholic Yes. Yep. And so when I look at the new church and I see that, it will be 51 years. Uh, May 6th. Wow, congratulations, Georgia. So the I know yep, there. that's beautiful. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. great. Yep. But we all went to church we there. Went to church there. We all went to church there as kids, and it was yeah. um, so I still call it the church building, but it's not. It hasn't been forever. I'm going to tell you one other thing, and then I'll stop because I'm, I'm being generous with my time here. I found in my grandmother's uh, scrapbook. A newspaper clipping about the rec park and it was when it first started they first started organizing developing the fairgrounds into Manchester Rec Park and the Manchester Recreation Association bought that property for twelve thousand dollars according to the article and the initial contributions came from the Rotary Pool Incorporated. The Rotary, the Rotary Pool was a separate entity from the Rotary Club, so they gave money. So did the Rotary Club, so did the Lions Club and the VFW. And there were two horse shows. Uh, horse shows have been happening here forever. The, the, the revenue from the horse shows went toward that. And then the, and I think that portion of it was like eight or 9,000 bucks. And then the rest of it came from a small handful of private donations, but I thought that was. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't write that down either, but um, I don't remember for sure. I would say probably, Bill, that it was. It was probably around the first of the 70s. This is what I'm thinking, yep. Yep. The, one of the things that my grandmother did was she cut those articles out of the paper, but she cut the dates off. So, so and sometimes you couldn't couldn't see the yeah. But I, I thought that was pretty interesting. You know, twelve twelve thousand dollars. But so I'm going to stop just because you can see that living in Manchester and having these roots like I have is I can't give it up. I, I, at this point in my life, I, I've loved being here my whole life and being with my family who all have stayed here too. You know, we've been able to, if, if we wanted to or needed to, can be together in a half an hour just because we all live so close by. But um, I've, I've, I love my life here. I, I always have the town's been good to me. I've had a good career that I didn't get rich at, but it's been wonderful to be a part of the town and, and be able to do what I do. And I've got a wonderful partner that's been here with me for almost 39 years. And and it's been, it's been good, and I intend that it's going to continue to be good, but in a different way, because I think I'll retire before long. But, but um, thank you so much. I don't know if anybody has any other questions, but this has been a privilege to be here today. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.